Here, I hold an object of tremendous beauty that also happens to take instant film pictures. It's called the Mint Instant Flex TL70, the only twin lens reflex instant camera in the 70 year history of the medium. Let's talk about this bad boy. The kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. Welcome to In An Instant, my name is Ben, and today's review digs into one of the most compelling and drop dead goo goo gaga smoking hot gorgeous instant film cameras of all time. What you're looking at is the Mint Instant Flex TL70, a camera that's been around for around four years and is often written off or not talked about due to people's difficulties with using it and the fact that it shoots in Stax Minis, which is perhaps too itsy bitsy for most serious shooters. I'm here to tell you though that despite those concerns, this little butte might be worth a solid look. There is much to talk about here, but I think the most prominent X factor is this TLR design. TLR or twin lens reflex is a type of camera with two lenses, as you can see, both with the same focal length, one of which you view the image through and the other which takes the picture. The viewing lens pipes through a mirror which displays onto a focusing screen surrounded by a hood. These cameras have been around since the 1800s, real OGs, and a new TLR hasn't come out in many, many years. This was more or less a defunct style of camera. Roly, the creator of the famous Rolyflex TLRs, actually gave quite a bit of guidance to Mint as they undertook this, and there is a slight variant Rolyflex logoed version that came out in 2018. So, you see SLRs every day. But TLRs have this very historical significance and the fact that Mint Camera has produced a new entry in the history books with guidance from the GOATs, engineered for the newer format of Instax film, is pretty remarkable. This thing is a true slice of camera history and for that alone, it has me freaking, as you can probably tell by the way I'm talking right now. Practically what this design is delivering to you is also pretty significant. Like an SLR, you can actually view almost the exact image you're shooting through the focusing screen. The image is flipped, which I'll get to in a minute, but you're essentially able to frame shots with precision, with almost no parallax at all. And you've got this lens, a 61 millimeter F6 to 22 wonder that simply doesn't exist on any other instant camera. The closest comparison would be an SX70 or an SLR 680, but even those lenses top out at F8. What that enables you to accomplish with shallow depth of field on this thing is totally unprecedented. You turn this wheel on the side of the camera here and that smoothly racks your focus and an additional magnifier pop-up helps you get a much closer look at the screen and ensure the subject is sharp. Really not sure what I was expecting initially when I picked this thing up, but on the very first day of shooting, the results just knocked me onto my ass, like rolled me down a hill, drowned me in a nearby ravine, gruesome death, just, I was in love. Just nutso image quality. And I also shot some comparisons with the SLR 680. The difference in color is obviously drastic since we're talking about Instax versus Polaroid, but also in the detail each camera is resolving. Instax minis are so small, so much smaller than a Polaroid, but look at these images blown up way beyond how they're intended to be viewed. The amount of image information in such a small print is a cuckoo bananas. And without a doubt, big for business. I was also eager to see how this camera would perform in studio. Using continuous lighting, no strobes, it was pretty easy to figure out the exposure, even with the automatic shutter speed, and the results are pretty wild. Really shows what this thing can do. If you've shot with a TLR before, you know this, but shooting from the hip also has a totally different feeling. It's a fresh perspective and a bit more personal than covering your face with the camera. You know, you can actually look your subject in the eye. It's, it's interesting, you know, everyone should try that. The design is beautiful, but functionally speaking, focus can be a bit of a challenge with the camera's lens wide open. Even being able to see the image you're shooting, I've had trouble nailing focus at f5.6. What's easy to forget with instant film, especially uh, Instax Mini, is that these are medium format images, even larger on the other film stocks. With that big negative, your field of view is larger and blowing backgrounds into soft focus is much easier than 35 millimeter or modern full frame cameras. So with such a narrow latitude, missing focus, it happens here and there, but you can even use F16 and still get out of focus background. Really cool, super hype, uh, big for bokeh freaks if 
that kind of thing wets your whistle. Here's also a major challenge shooting with this camera wide open or really at any aperture, and that's the shutter speed limitation. When you see photos taken with this camera, you might have noticed a lot of overexposure, people struggling mightily not to blow out their images. At 5.6, even at f16 with ISO 800 film, which is what you've got on Instax, there's no way to compensate for the strength of sunlight in camera. The max shutter speed is listed at 1 500th of a second, but it's unclear if the shutter speed can even mechanically get that high. So out of the box, this camera really isn't gonna work outside. A huge bummer for people who didn't realize this before smashing by, you know, and are now writing negative Amazon reviews. I knew it going in, so I prepared the troops. I had my neutral density filters at the ready, and I've done a lot of experimenting with these, so here are your options. You could A, spend $120 and buy Mint's lens filter set. This comes with NDs of various strengths that attach directly to the lens. B, you could use a large ND filter that you might already have, which covers the entire lower lens area. Or C, you could use a small ND filter that only covers the taking lens. And you gotta handhold these or make your own adapter. Here's the distinction between B and C. If you use a large ND filter, this is a 77 millimeter filter, it's not only covering the lens, but also the light meter, which is right below the lens here. This means the camera is gonna try to give you the correct automatic shutter speed given how you filter the lens because you're covering the light meter as well. Whereas with a smaller ND filter, you're not telling the light meter what's up. You're just covering the lens. It's gonna automatically max out the shutter speed and in that case kind of becomes a fully manual camera. If you keep your exposure comp at minus one, the shutter speed will be all the way cranked and ultimately your exposure will be the result of how strongly you filtered the light with these ND filters. I think I prefer to use a small ND. This one's a 43 millimeter ND4. I got it for around 30 bucks and just let that shutter speed fly up. To me, it's the most predictable way to handle this whole problem. Mint's native filter set also doesn't cover the light meter, so I think it's what they'd recommend. This is all very clunky, extremely annoying, and is definitely my biggest bone to pick with Mint. If your camera basically isn't gonna work outside right out of the box, include a fucking filter. This camera retails for $389. You can find it a bit cheaper on eBay, but this is really just a nice product that fails for so many people who aren't trying to spend another 120 bucks on a little lens set that could have been included to make the camera functional. I'm heated. I'm burning up right now. Anyway, uh, some other things to mention. Back to the focusing screen. Um, it is flipped, as I mentioned. While you're getting a very accurate picture of your framing, it is a bit disorienting at first, trying to correct your horizon line and frame left or right. Your brain has to adjust to all that. You've also got frame lines in here for the mini, since you are looking at a square screen for a vertical format. A light turns to green if exposure is good, and amber if it's iffy when you half press the shutter. And that tends to honestly not always be super accurate. So you just gotta be thinking about your settings. Another option while shooting besides the focusing screen and the magnifier is this little hole in here. Um, but unless you have your focusing distance precisely dialed mentally, I'm not really sure how you would use this and get anything in focus. It's hard enough with the focusing screen. Um, double exposure, like I showed in some of these examples, is super easy to accomplish because the shutter button can be fired as many times as you like, while the button to eject the film is completely separate. I love this feature. Let's just do one right now. So we got one, then we got two, and then we eject. Um, I've had a couple ejection problems, some jamming with this camera, which has caused some bad light leakage. It's because the rollers on it are tighter than most cameras. You know, it happens. It's, it's not perfect. Opening the lens hood is also what turns the camera on. I feel like I should probably mention that. And so none of these buttons will accidentally fire, you know, while this is closed. This camera also has a beautifully disguised small flash bar in here, underneath the logo. Such a good idea. It really would have been ugly to have this constantly visible because, you know, these didn't have flash like that. I never use flash, so I just love that it's tucked away. Your aperture ring also has an F bokeh setting, which I never use, but can produce interesting results apparently. And the frame counter window here is on the side. Another bizarre quirk is mine seems to stop between numbers, a really, really annoying problem that others have experienced. So numerous times I've taken a shot only to realize, you know, I had no shots left or took a film cartridge out with one still left in the tank. 
none of that is super tight. And the last complaint to address, I think, is the Instax mini aspect of this whole thing. This is such a serious camera to shoot the smallest format available of instant film with. Part of this was tough timing. Pretty much right after this camera was released, the Instax Square format hit the market. I think in retrospect, they would have made this an Instax Square camera instead, but Mint has really moved on from this product now, and I believe they've got something else cooking for the Square. We'll see. So I hear. But I will say that despite my initial reservations about shooting on Instax Mini, this camera has taught me some good lessons about trying to create a compelling photograph regardless of a small frame size. And there's something obviously liberating about using a lower cost instant film stock that encourages you to think differently. Consider what works and what doesn't at this small scale. And even make pairs of images that go together in sets, which I've had a blast doing. I've enjoyed having this camera as a spin-off option if I don't want to burn through a pricier pack of Polaroid. So this is fitting in my arsenal right now. Pros and cons, let's freaking do it. Incredible manual focus lens. This thing is just offering you something almost no other camera in instant film history can. The TLR design. This camera is a piece of history and the functionality afforded by that design really sets it apart. Viewfinder. This is part of the TLR aspect, obviously, but an important thing to break out here. You could count on one hand how many instant film cameras can actually show you what your frame is accurately, and this is one of a kind. Quick note, too, this is the 2.0 version of this camera, which has a much brighter viewfinder. If you're looking to buy this, make sure you get the 2.0 version. And cons. The Instax Mini format. You could feel how powerful this thing would be on a larger format, and it's a shame there isn't a square version. Price. At $300 to $400, is a lot of money to spend on an Instax Mini camera. However, you know, this is a nice camera. It's a nice new camera, and usually nice new cameras cost more than this, so I honestly understand that. Quirks. Things like jamming, the exposure counter being weird. Not ideal for the money you're spending. And finally, the overall exposure problem. The shutter speed maximum, getting to, having to buy the ND filters, etc. No need to relitigate it. No need to get heated again. Just wish they included the filters. I'm not trying to get fired up again. All right. Now, there's a ton more I could say, but I think I'm just going to go ahead and cut myself off here. <laughs> Thank you for watching. In an instant, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more reviews, breakdowns, and all things instant. Bye.